uh, to turn that up. If you've got a Bible to hand, you might like to turn up John chapter 20 um, and uh, we're going to pray together. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for this Easter day. We thank you uh, that there is joy to be found, life in all its fullness uh, and an intimacy with you. And we pray that you would help us as we uh, read what might be uh, familiar words or something we've heard about before. We pray you'd make it fresh for us and speak to us anew by your spirit, we pray in Jesus name. Amen. Well, uh, I don't know if you're a fan of biographies or not. I know some people who've got uh, shelves full uh, and others who um, have only read one if they were made to at school. But the thing about biographies is that they end, obviously, when the person dies. And autobiographies, the ones that are written by the people who write them themselves, end well before the inevitable. But that means that what we've had read for us today and what we've got in the Bible before us in John chapter 20 simply shouldn't exist. It shouldn't be there. Jesus died. So that must be the end, isn't it? Well, the good news of Easter is that that's only the beginning, in a sense. That first Easter day was a day when sorrow was turned to joy and friends were made into family. Yes, sorrow was turned to joy and friends became family. As we come to this account of the resurrection in John's gospel, I hope that you can see what makes it so compelling. This is the opposite of propaganda. It's evidence of the historical account of what happened. And I don't mean that just because it's there written for us and because people say that, that it's the truth, but because of what's there and what's missing. I don't know if it struck you as you read, but the main people who are in focus here don't get it. They don't know what's happening and they don't expect what's to come. Which means that this gospel is a very public uh, confession of their ignorance. Uh, it's not a, a kind of whitewashed account of people who knew exactly what to expect and it all went to plan. And that's why when we meet Mary, she's looking for Jesus's body, not a risen saviour. But how, for those of us who've heard this uh, many, many times over many years, maybe, um, can this be fresh for us? Again, can it be new to us? Well, when we hear the news on the television, when we read accounts of things that have happened, they're so often abridged, aren't they? They're kind of squished up. We're given a simplified version of events. Like if someone asked me what happened, well, I, I have to kind of uh, compress it and just give a kind of summary of uh, what's happened, a shorthand account, if you like. And I think that's what we do with those things that are familiar to us, don't we? We don't remember every single detail, um, but we remember the big picture. We remember the, the key points. And that might be the same for Easter. We remember the time running up to uh, Easter, Jesus' uh, triumphal entry, as it's called, as he rode into Jerusalem on the donkey. We've got some recognition that there was a, a kind of unfair trial, that Jesus was brought up on all these false um accusations and that even the person who put him to death on the cross uh, thought he was innocent and yet because we kind of have a shorthand we can so often miss uh, the key we can uh, be too familiar and therefore miss the the immense reality of what's before us of what the resurrection really means and not just as a cold theological truth that Jesus died and he's risen again, but more than that, a life-changing reality. I don't know if you've ever had the privilege of watching someone maybe later in life come to faith and grapple with all these truths. Uh, if you have, then you'll know that they ask the best questions. Um, they ask questions that you would never dream of asking 
questions that you'd never thought of, even though you're sat there reading the same things, having heard the same things. And the other thing that's so amazing is their appetite, the urgency with which they uh, approach things uh, that maybe for us has faded over the years. Um, thank you. Well, let's look closely, shall we, uh, at the cross and the resurrection and how they can bring joy and sorrow, joy out of sorrow and intimacy with God. Because if it changed the lives of those who witnessed it, then it should change our lives too. So for those of you with a good imagination, you might like to picture yourself uh, in a garden with a tomb. Uh, for others, we can just imagine that we're stood alongside Mary Magdalene. Mary, who is one of Jesus' friends and followers. And that's why when we meet with her by the tomb, she is broken and sobbing. She comes back to the tomb and she peers in again and sees two people sitting there where Jesus' body has been. Now, John tells us that they're angels, but Mary doesn't seem to notice anything strange. Clearly, God is up to something. And yet, instead of announcing the good news, uh, as the angels so often do, do not be afraid, I have great tidings. Um, they simply ask Mary why she's crying. And Mary tells them, she says, they've taken my Lord away and I don't know where they've put him. And she turns around and someone else is standing behind her. Again, Mary fails to recognise who it is. And this man asks Mary, why are you crying? And gently and lovingly adds, who is it you're looking for? There must have been a moment of relief as Mary assumes that she's found the gardener, someone who will know what's happening and what's going on. So she just blurts out, sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've put him and I will get him. Then everything changes. This stranger speaks. And in a moment, everything changes. As Mary hears her name being uttered and all of a sudden she knows that it's Jesus. In her grief and the, the difference of Jesus' transformed, resurrected body, she was kept from seeing the very person that she was looking for. And yet in a heartbeat, she's gone from uh, wanting to plan a second burial to be confronted by a living, breathing Lord. Only something significant has changed. In a moment, her grief have been exchanged for joy and an embrace as she holds on to Jesus, overwhelmed with love, afraid that she might lose him or just wanting confirmation that he's really there. She holds on tight. Yet almost as soon as Mary clings to Jesus, he sends her on a mission. Jesus commissions her and reveals what has changed because of his resurrection, how significant his death on the cross was. Jesus commissions Mary with words that don't just change uh, her life, but change our life, our whole relationship with God. Back in John chapter 15, before the cross, as Jesus was comforting his friends, he said, I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. But now... Now something has changed beyond even friendship. Jesus says, I am ascending to my father and your father. And he sends Mary off to his brothers. And by that, he means his followers. Which means that at the cross, then it wasn't just the earth that shook, but the very nature of our relationship and our access to God. What once seemed impossible is now made possible through Jesus. We don't just have uh, 
the kind of relationship of a servant and master. We know what they do. We kind of know their business, but there's certainly no um, relationship there, no friendship. We don't even know God as a friend. And friends know each other, don't they? They, they have that special connection. But no, because of the cross, God the Father is now our Father. And we've probably prayed that if we've prayed the Lord's Prayer countless times, our Father. And yet, do we really know what that means? Do we really take uh, stock of what we're saying? Because we have the same relationship with God the Father as Jesus. Jesus, the Son, who has enjoyed that eternal relationship, Father-Son relationship with God for all eternity. And so as that, that curtain was torn open, as the earth shook and as Jesus rose to life, the way was open for us so that we could come to God as our Father. And that means that Jesus has created a family, not a club or a society or a, a collection of like-minded people, but a real family. And that's why leaving Christchurch is going to be so hard for us. It's not because of the place, although Williston is a beautiful place. It's not the church building, although we've so many memories here. No, the sadness comes from leaving you because you are our family. The good news of Easter is that we are made brothers and sisters in Christ. And that won't change. It doesn't matter where we are. We followed God's call to come to Williston. And now he's calling us to love and serve in a new place. Even though we don't know where that is yet. So we'll miss you precisely because you're you're our family it was hard to think of an illustration that might begin to capture this so just bear with me because i think this is the best i could do but it's a bit like the difference between foster care and a job and adoption being fostered is usually a temporary thing it doesn't make you a member of the family. You're close enough to see what it would be like, but you're not part, you're not one of them. Whatever you do, nothing can change that relationship. That is, unless they choose to adopt you. All of a sudden, everything changes. Now you are one of the family. Now you are one of them, not just a guest but a member of the family. And this is a tiny uh, glimpse into the reality of what happened on the cross, of Jesus' resurrection. And yet there are lots of people who struggle to believe that God could love them that much, feeling that they don't deserve his love. Well, the truth is none of us deserve the love of God, especially in the way that he's poured it out for us. And yet that's what makes it so remarkable. John chapter 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, so that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Jesus' love throughout his earthly life was so countercultural so challenging he valued outcasts he welcomed the sick and the disabled those from other religions and cultures and he treated women with a dignity and importance that we are still yet to learn and here on the most important day of the year he chose mary to be the one to announce the resurrection She's the one that we remember in this account. Which is why in the early church, Mary was called an apostle to the apostles as she spoke the good news 
the, the news of the resurrection to the disciples. And in 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, it says, See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. We don't deserve God's love. And by nature, we would always prefer to try and earn our own pardon, our own uh, right place with God. And yet that's impossible which is why we need Jesus. It's why his uh, conscious decision to come to earth from heaven, to live his life in perfect obedience to the Father and to give up his life on the cross means so much. It's why we need him to take our place, to take our sin and the punishment that we deserve on himself. And it's why that sacrificial love has been retold and reimagined in countless stories ever since echoing through literature, film and folk tales. Because the story uh, resonates. So how do we respond to such a lavish and undeserved love? How do we process what Jesus has done? Well, one way is to respond with thanks and praise and hope. Christians shouldn't be defeated by grief, death or loss. And sadly, I've seen people who have been defeated by those things. Yet Christians have hope even in death because Jesus is alive. At funerals, I say the cross brings joy out of grief and life out of death. Because Jesus is alive. For those who love Jesus, death is not the end, but the step before the beginning. The beginning of our resurrection life in full. It's only God who could save the best till last. God who... Uh, makes this life as wonderful as it is an appetizer for what's to come. So if we are people of the resurrection, people of faith in Jesus, then we ought to be people of hope and joy. Because one day we will live forever with our Father in perfect love, in a place where sin and death are no more, where pain and hurt and illness and sadness are a thing of the past. Because Jesus is alive and because he's alive, we live too. We live now as part of God's family and one day we will live forever when Jesus returns or he calls us home. And just as Mary's sorrow was turned into a loving embrace, so Jesus' resurrection means life, joy and peace. But finally, there's another aspect to our response. Because we're called to be members of God's family. So wouldn't it be wonderful if each day as we woke up, we remembered that we are children of our heavenly father. That because Jesus is alive, his father is our father. Which gives us a responsibility, really. I don't know if you think about this much, but he's made us into a family. He's made us brothers and sisters, and so we need to love one another. We need to care for one another as a family ought to. But also it means that we have the same access to the Father as Jesus, which <laughs> was quite hard to put to paper. It seems wrong. It almost feels like blasphemy, doesn't it? until we remember that that's what Jesus wanted, that that's what he achieved on the cross. That God raised Jesus up and Jesus in turn raised us. It doesn't in any way diminish God 
his holiness, his awesomeness, his splendor doesn't change who he is. It only magnifies his grace that he might welcome us and include us in his family. It only explains what grace truly is. So let's love one another because Jesus died to make us a family. So what did we see as we uh, glimpse more closely into this uh, first Easter day? We saw sorrows turn to joy and friends turned to family. So we praise God for Jesus because he is alive. We thank God that his love endures forever and ever. We praise God, our Father, for sending his Son. We thank Jesus for giving his life for us and rising to life that we might have hope even in death that we might live our resurrection lives and we thank God for his spirit who enables us to live for him, the power to live and to be changed into the likeness of Christ day by day. And we pray that he'd give us boldness to be people who like Mary were witnesses to his resurrection and his life. And we do this, we live our lives all for his glory now and always. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that even in shorthand, even our compressed, abridged version of uh, the, the Easter story is wonderful in itself. We thank you that Jesus died and rose again for us. And because of that, we can have life. But we thank you that there is so much more involved, so much more for us to respond to than that. We thank you that you are a God of love and hope. That you bring uh, and turn tears of sadness into uh, laughter and joy that you remind us that death is not the end, but in Christ it is uh, the beginning of life eternal. And we thank you, God, for blessing us with our church family, and we pray that you would help us to care for that family, to love them as our brothers and sisters in Christ. And Father, help us to be witnesses to the good news of Easter that we might have the boldness to share all that you have done for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.